Hey folks, Jeff Salzman here. Welcome to the Daily Evolver. It's Wednesday, March 3rd. I'm very happy to be with you. Especially appreciate those of you who are tuning in live. And I wanted to say, if you are on the Zoom app through Integral Life, or if you want to email me at jeff at dailyevolver.com, I will look at any questions that come up or comments. What I do, of course, here at the Daily Evolver is I look at current events and politics and culture and spirituality and all of that through the lens of integral evolutionary theory, which posits that both consciousness and its collective counterpart, culture, individual consciousness, collective culture, evolve through stages. So one of the sort of positions or, or views of integral is that humanity has evolved through six, six stages, which I'm not going to get in. But if you're interested in any of this, I have a theory section on my dailyevolver.com website. And we're moving into integral consciousness, according to this theory, which is the seventh stage of consciousness. And it is characterized by a conscious integration. It's called integral. Uh, a conscious integration of the best of the previous six stages. Okay, that's one really sort of practical, useful way of looking at it. And it asks us to then look at the previous stages of development, which we can see now because we're in this amazing historical moment where we know all about history and cultures and so forth. And the whole smorgasbord is laid out in front of us. And we see what is good and what isn't good about the previous stages. And uh, basically, you know, one of the easy sort of back pocket ways of looking at, you know, differentiating what's what we call good versus mean of these previous stages is to see that every stage has an amazing, brilliant evolutionary gift, something new that emerged into humanity and perhaps the cosmos that had never been there before. And uh, that's fantastic. What's sort of mean about each of the stages is they think they're the only one that's right. They think that their realization and their gift is the only good one. And a lot of times that means splitting off the previous ones and oppression and all of that good stuff that makes up human history. So what I have talked about in the last year or so is something that I hadn't really thought about much or talked about, and that is mean orange. And orange is the color, is the color that we use to define modernity. And you know, just to lay it out real quick, the, the, the three big stages that are online in the developed world um, the, 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 are the final three stages, traditionalism, modernity, and postmodernity. And then the seventh integral is coming out of those. So looking at the good and bad of those latest stages is really a good project of integral. And, uh, you know, we talk a lot about mean green and, you know, how the uh, left can go totalitarian. But what we don't talk about as much is how the previous stages do that and, and actually do it worse uh, because the nature of evolution is that things become more um, good, true, and beautiful, as hard as that is kind of to imagine. But if, uh, you know, if it's another podcast that I've done many times, but we're gonna, that's the assumption here uh, that uh, there is a particularly a meanness to orange that we don't often identify. And that's basically you know, the downside of the upside. Again, the, the upside uh, of, every, of, st of every stage is, is really important. And in the case of orange or modernity, orange demystifies the world. You know, orange gives logic and material explanations to, to the phenomena of life so that we don't have to throw virgins into the volcano anymore, basically, to use Ken Wilber's great line. Um, and that's a good thing, you know, the, the, the horrors of pre-modern culture where we, spirit and, um, you know, gods were alive, were, um, you know, that, that needed to be purified. And orange does it. 
it basically explains it all away. And that's the mean side of orange is that it disenchants the world. So it demystifies the world, but it also disenchants the world. And so, you know, we want to notice that because there are, there are consequences to that, that, um, that we can see and I'll point out. So I'm going to look at a couple things that crossed my desk <laughs> uh, over the last week. And the first one is a column. I'm, I, I, those of you who've listened to me for any length of time know that I'm a sucker for um, advice columns. And I just love hearing people with their problems and people's trying to solve their problems. And anyway, this is the latest advice column that we have now. It used to be Dear Abby or Ann Landers, but now it's Ask Amy. And she's in the newspaper every morning here in Boulder. And she's syndicated all over the place. And she's Amy Dickinson, Ask Amy. And here is um, the, that's actually only one question today. And here it is, I'm gonna read the whole question. The headline is, an offer of prayer doesn't sit well. Dear Amy, my husband had knee replacement surgery at a Catholic hospital last week. The first few weeks of his physical therapy are done at our home. The first session was today. Everything went well, and when it was time for her to leave, the therapist asked if my husband wanted to pray with her. She said she, it was totally up to him. He said yes. She said a short prayer and left. I was stunned. Is this something new? I have been seen by a lot of healthcare professionals, and no one, all caps, has ever asked me to pray with them. We live in the Bible Belt, so I thought this might have something to do with it. Your thoughts? And signed, I'll pray by myself. All right, so Amy responds, dear, I'll pray. And then she goes through some research that she often does. And, and in this case, it's research that shows that 88% of people who are offered prayer in hospitals, and by the way, this is a Catholic hospital. I mean, really, 88% uh, uh, accepted the offer of prayer who, who were offered. 83% found it helpful and 51% wanted it daily. Patients, the, the conclusion of the study is that patients may welcome prayer as long as the clinician shows, quote, genuine kindness and respect. So that's the beginning of her answer. And then she goes on, this is Amy responding, saying, even though it might be unusual, I don't think it is necessarily unethical for a healthcare provider to offer, offer to pray with a patient. Well, how lovely is that? It's not unethical, good. Even in the patient's own home. Doing so might help to build a connection between the therapist and patient. Prayer might help to relax the patient and center his intentions towards his own health and recovery. The offer might also feel like coercion. How did your husband feel about the practice? He should prepare himself to respond before his next appointment. A reminder that this is his treatment and he gets to decide how to handle it, regardless of how you feel about it. So that's good. I think it's a reasonably good answer in an orange world that you know you would ask and, um, and that it's up to him and some people like it. And so, you know, a good answer in the modern world. But let's look at what that answer is missing. And what it's missing is, well, it just has a casual disregard for the actual central premise of prayer that has been done for tens of thousands of years, perhaps hundreds. And that is that you are asking God or some conception of a, a divine other, that's not you, that you are asking them for help. And for people who have a relationship with a divine other, it's not just about kindness and respect of the clinician, as wonderful as that is. It's not just a means of centering your intentions to your own health and recovery. It is a direct portal to 
again, a divine other who sees me and loves me and responds to my suffering and to my surrender, and who one day, maybe soon if I'm sick, will welcome home my immortal soul. So that's what it's missing. <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm just saying uh, th this is what modernity has done. Uh, thank God for modernity. I'm not arguing against modernity. Every stage comes in with its good side and its bad side. That seems to be the way God set it up. But I do point out that until modernity, about 300 years ago, and maybe even in this country, you know, 100 years ago, it's when the schools outlawed prayer, um, everybody believed it. Everybody. You know, and let's not even use the word believed, actually, because believing in God is actually a modern conception. You know, it's a modern way of thinking about it, even. From their perspective, pre-modern people have a relationship with God. They're swimming in God. They feel his, her, or its presence. They see God's work in the world. Uh, and, and, and yes, Buddhists, too, in pre-modern pre times. They're full of deities. Um, these impersonal religions often have personal sides, second-person dimensions. You know, for to have a full plate of reality, we need first person, our own interior, second person, our relationships with the others, and not just physical human others. And uh, we need it's, we need the world to play in. So all three of those have to be online. And the second person was only of God, of the spirit, the second person of spirit was only banished by modernity, you know, not that long ago. So, um, you know, we had the power gods in red, we had the nature spirits in magenta. And uh, so anyway, so how do we bring that into integral? Uh, you know, this relationship with a divine other that's not me, it's not my higher self, it's not, you know, just kindness or helping other people. It's actually somebody who sees me and loves me. And how do I bring that online without and still leave behind all of the horrors and and and, and tragedies of pre-modern life and here's where i take a cue from carl jung i've always loved this line from him and he famously answered the question do you believe in god carl jung by answering no i know god and i love that and that is um, that's pretty open-ended, you know, I, I, not knowing um, the details, not believing in things that I don't actually experience. I can jettison all of that and just sort of, I mean, what I do is I just kind of work with it on my own. It's like, at some point I realized that why I wasn't praying was because <laughs> I didn't want to bother God. I actually think that was true. I thought, surely God has some better things to do, even if I sort of feel God's presence, than to listen to what I need, and, you know, my problems. But um, over time, and really in the last few years, I've developed, and, and I'm not arguing for this, I just think this is a, a way to go and it works for me, is that I have divine um, guides who have been assigned to me and they sort of show up in a thought bubble <laughs> over my head when I ask them to. And if, you know, in, in God, for, for, for practical purposes, is God's the sun shining in the background. I don't have to worry so much about that. In fact, I don't even want to look at it. It's too bright. But these guys, and they sort of change. There's kind of like a, a Monty Python troupe if it was more multicultural and had women. <laughs> it's kind of like, they're a little goofy, but they're smart. And, you know, just recently, I, I've been thinking about this idea of, do I want a green burial? Do I want this burial, it's legal, legal in Colorado, where they just wrap you in a shroud and put you in the dirt? No casket, no cremation. It's the most ecologically sound and, it's, you know, God knows it's, um, has a fine tra tradition in humanity. Uh, but it's like, you know, the worms crawl in, the worms crawl out. And I, 
ask my guides, what should I do? And I look up and see them and it's just thumbs up, absolute thumbs up. And so, you know, that gives me, I know it's the right thing, but it, it gives me confidence to move forward. I might ask them how to deal with a person who I'm having difficulties with. And it's not always a quick answer because there isn't one, but there's a softening of my heart generally. I mean, it's generally something I can do that's in the realm of surrender, which I despise, but somehow they help me along. They really do. I mean, it just becomes obvious that that's the right thing to do. And somewhere along the line, I've laid down a weapon and I didn't even kind of realize it. And I appreciate that. And, and it's pretty reliable, you know, for me as I, you know, provided I'm asking for growth and not just for, you know, the Mercedes Benz. So, you know, even ideas for the Daily Evolver, I'll, I'll sometimes say, can you guys help me work this out? And I don't know, seems to help. Anyway, that's, you know, a knowing, an experience, a cause and effect that I can identify that when I identify it as being something other, I'm a bigger person. You know, I, is it, I could, I just, and I have my friends, I tell my friends and they're like, oh, you're, yeah, you're calling on your higher self. Eh, I don't know. I don't, I much prefer that they be another. And I think that second person is built into the cosmos and that atoms, as Richard Feynman said, are playful. And, um, you know, it's, it's second person all the way up and it still is, it's built in. It's a deep structure of the universe. And, you know, modernity denies that reality and, and only because they can't access it. Uh, it's, you know, meaning and why, and, you know, that sort of thing is, it's not material. It's, it's non-material reality, but it's reality, you know, uh, and, um, they, you know, they see it as delusional or quaint and that's a problem, you know, that, that, that actually, you know, it's not a problem in the sense that it shouldn't have happened. I mean, this is welcome to human evolution, but it does have effects. And uh, so I'm gonna to get to my second thing I wanna share, which is an article, an essay actually, proper essay, written by a young woman, Freya India in the UK. And she's talking about her generation, Generation Z. And Generation Z are the people who are under 25. So they haven't hit their Saturn return yet. These are our young people. And her headline is, my generation isn't suffering enough. And, you know, I think she gets to some of what the effects of mean orange are. So uh, I'll, I'll read a little bit of what she wrote and comment on it just a bit. She says, my generation is miserable. Gen Z, those of us born after 1997, are the saddest, loneliest, and most mentally fragile age group to date. Cursed with rising rates of anxiety, depression, and suicide. How can that be? How can a generation with everything feel so desperately unhappy? By almost every metric, human life is dramatically better today than it has ever been. And then she goes through and she talks about poverty and illiteracy and mortality and battle deaths and all the things you're in the daily evolve for all the time. And that I quote here, Generation Z are heirs to an immense fortune, colon, a utopian world of instant gratification and technological dynamism. In theory, this should be the age of happiness. And yet, misery abounds. And then she goes into some statistics. 54% of Gen Z report anxiety and nervousness, as opposed to 34% of the average population. Uh, she says this isn't just a case of self-reporting either, because the suicide rate for Americans aged 15 to 24 has risen over 51% in the last decade. For Gen Z women in particular, suicide rates have risen a staggering 87% since 2007. In my home country of the UK, one in four girls is clinically depressed by the time they are 14. 
So that's, uh, and, and, you know, we do see this and um, hear a lot about it. And, um, you know, as she says, there's no shortage of articles trying to make sense of it. Uh, the mental health epidemic in the time of global prosperity. Teens and preteens today, we're told, are simply interred between beneath the weight of political issues like climate change, immigration, sexual assault, as well as fatigued by job stress, exam burnout, and the attainment of unrealistic social media standards. And then she points out that there's a wider range of mental health services available than any before. Gen Z is far more likely to seek them out. Um, and um, then she says, so for rates of mental illness and suicide to be so high in a time of relative peace, there must exist a more convincing explanation than the simple asperities of life. And so then she goes on to her solution. And remember the title is my generation isn't suffering enough. And her solution is more suffering. And I, I think she's really on to something. So I'm gonna share some what she wrote here. She talks about voluntary discomfort which she describes as a vaccine administered short-term. It's it administered short-term pain to reduce long-term suffering. This involves integrating simple yet unpleasant tasks into your life. Meditation, cold showers, fasting, having more passionate good faith arguments, getting out of your comfort zone. And she goes through the history of this sort of thing, voluntary discomfort, and talks about the Stoics and the Greeks, and you know, she knows her way around history. And she uh, comes uh, 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 to, uh, I think it's the last one, yeah, that she mentions. And it's Friedrich Nietzsche, and she quotes him. And I just have to share this, it's so good. This is a little piece of prose from Nietzsche, just a paragraph. He says, in man, creature and creator are united. I'll say that again. In man, creature and created are united. In man, there is material, fragment, excess, clay, dirt, nonsense, chaos. But there is also the creator, the sculptor, the hardness of the hammer, the divinity of the spectator, and the seventh day. Do you understand this contrast? The body must be fashioned, bruised, forged, stretched, roasted, and refined. It is meant to suffer. Jesus, how about that? You know, he's kind of like Walt, Whit Walt Whitman's evil twin. I mean, it has that same kind of big, florid, you know, poetry, but geez. Anyway, I, I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I, you know, what a beautiful thing to, to ponder. And she does. Yeah, she does talk about that there is a, 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 um, a dearth of meaning uh, and that there's actually meaning to be found in suffering. That's how she sort of connects the two. And... Uh, you know, here, here's what she says at the end. She says, as well as robust mental health resources in our institutions, we need to see more balanced, we need to see a more balanced approach to Gen Z's mental well being. One that coalesces self care with strenuous, humbling self development. My message for my generation is to dare to switch off, switch off Netflix. Abandon your excuses and bear the unbearable. It may not be what we want to hear, but it may be just what a miserable generation needs. And, you know, I do think that that's true and that's really onto something. And I, I know myself, fasting and cold showers have been a remarkably, and some types of breathing where you, you know, reorient your energy basically lowering your chakras. All of these kinds of things are very good. She talks about that as well. Um, 
But I would say that there's still something missing that orange, mean orange, isn't allowing in. And that's a re-enchantment, you know. As I said, you know, to go back to dear Amy and the woman who didn't like the prayer, you know, it's, it's, it is about being kind, but it's not just about being kind. It is about setting your intentions, but it's not just about setting your intentions. It is about strenuous, humbling self-development, which is what our young Freya recommends. But it's not just about strenuous, humbling self-development and finding meaning and suffering. It's about finding meaning in connecting to the bigger story, you know, the one about something bursting out of nothing 13.8 billion years ago and complexifying into us in our world. You know, all those subatomic particles coalesced into this conversation. I mean, it's just mind blowing. I mean, if there isn't a religion in there somewhere, I don't know what we're looking for. And, um, you know, and it's funny because soulless science delivers the story to us. It's because of science that we know this. And it is, um, you know, I, 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 I think that that's, you know, so, you know, it's not just suffering. It's like, I, I was talking to my buddy, Steve McIntosh last night about this. And I asked him point blank, I said, okay, so how would you put it, the integral view here? What is the purpose? What is the meaning of life? And he had a great answer. He said, to participate in the perfection of the universe. To participate in the perfection of the universe. So with that, you know, sort of bigger view, it's like, you're not just personal, you're not just even transpersonal, you're, you know, part of the bigger universe perfecting itself, whatever that means. And everything you do, and every thought you think is a choice you can make to, you know, move things towards goodness, truth and beauty. And it doesn't end with your life. Everything you do reverberates, eternity and infinity, infinity are are, you know, it's the reality that we live in. So, oh, okay, well, here's a question. There's something I reflected on in myself and seen in many others over the years. And I think it partly comes down to most people being a lot less evolved than they think they are. As Ken Wilbur has said, the cognitive line of development and that's the line that sort of leads the way. It's what we're actually able to see and relate to. It's not necessarily cognition in the sense of intelligence, but it, it's what we're able to actually include in our field of awareness. Um, so anyway, the cognitive line develops fastest. And just because an individual is able to grok integral and see its benefits or application in the world, doesn't mean their identity and egoic center of gravity is anywhere near that higher realm. For the most part, everyone seems to be right there with the rest of adults bridging from the socialized mind to the self, self authoring mind, to use Keegan's term. Um, and this is kind of orange green. For myself, at least, this seems to be the case and seems to reflect what I've seen in others people thinking they're integral when they're just trading one sort of fundamentalism for another. Well, um, <laughs> the, the, there are many things I understand and can articulate without yet living them in a deeply expressed and embodied way. Totally, absolutely true, absolutely true. Yeah, no, um, uh, cog cognitive development in, in, into integral, which is basically seeing evolution, you know, and then feeling evolution. That's sort of the difference between teal and turquoise. Those, um, you know, we can, sort of find our way there uh, on a good day. And maybe, you know, that'll permeate the other lines of our development, such as our emotional development and our moral development and our interpersonal development. And even our, you know, development of our physical and subtle bodies and all of the lines that we can develop. Um, the cognition helps us to do that because it's always 
deconstructing and reconstructing our story. It's doing what I just said. It's demystifying and re-enchanting our life. And no, I mean, I am um, uh, arrested <laughs> in many of the early stages of development in very many lines. <sighs> it's exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I know it, at least on a good day, I can see it instead of be it. On a good, even better day, sometimes I'll have flashes of, you know, feeling emotionally integral, where I just I have a certain fearlessness and playfulness about life that I think is probably a marker of that. And I have tastes of that. But yeah, we, we actually do think our way forward, you know. It, so did modernity. So, you know, so probably did traditionalism. I think it did actually. You know, as, as, as Ken Wilber says, uh, people were thinking modern thoughts for 300 years before anything happened. And so thoughts are things, and thinking integrally is worth it on its own terms. And, you know, the rest of it kind of keeps up. So yeah, so cool. Thank you for that question. And um, yeah, if there's anything else, I think. Oh, wait. Oh, here from Joe. Uh, that was beautiful, Jeff. I'm a scientist and engineer and completely aligned. The science narrative provides a pointer to something quite deeper, so many holes in our understanding. If Mean Orange can just take a deeper look into those portals, the whole discussion of the observer and the role of consciousness or awareness is just one. Modernity has reduced us to particles, separate bags of flesh, but the narrative has, has so many holes, deepest thanks. Right on. Well said. Thank you, Joe. All right. Well, what fun. Uh, thanks for being with me for another Daily Evolver. And again, especially for those of you joining live, I'll be back 1 o'clock p.m. Mountain Time uh, next Wednesday, and we'll keep going here and figure this out. All right. Take care, folks. Bye.